What's up, biology students? Mr. Holloway here. Today we're going to learn about a pretty interesting scientific theory. This theory, called endosymbiotic theory, explains the origin of two really important cellular structures that support life on our planet by helping our cells to transform and use energy. Earlier in the year, we learned about the two basic kinds of cells, prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotes, like this bacterium here, are smaller and simpler overall. They reproduce asexually, they contain no nucleus or any other membrane-bound organelles, and they are always single-celled. Eukaryotic cells, like our plants, animals, and fungi, are typically bigger. They contain a variety of membrane-bound organelles, including a nucleus, and they can be multicellular. Today's story takes place a long time ago, and involves a peculiar relationship between early versions of both of these basic cell types. Specifically, endosymbiotic theory is the story of these two organelles, the mitochondria, where cellular respiration takes place, and the chloroplast, where photosynthesis takes place. I really cannot overstate how important these two structures are in supporting life on our planet, because they are absolutely crucial for life as we know it. Photosynthetic plants and algae support most ecosystems on our planet, converting unusable atmospheric carbon into usable organic carbon, i.e. carbohydrates, that can be utilized by every organism in the food web. Cellular respiration allows organisms of all varieties to transform the stored energy in these carbohydrates into ATP, the main source of energy for the cell. Every cell in our body contains mitochondria to provide it with energy in the form of ATP, and the molecules needed to fuel this process are produced by chloroplasts inside of plant cells. So needless to say, these two structures are pretty darn important. Interestingly, our best evidence suggests that these two processes existed on our planet well before the first eukaryotic cells existed. Our planet is roughly 4.6 billion years old. The first living cells appeared in the fossil record roughly 3.6 billion years ago, and evidence of photosynthesis appeared in the fossil record about a billion years after that, beginning about 2.6 billion years ago. It would be another billion years or so before the first eukaryotic organisms appeared on our planet, and during that time, oxygen produced by photosynthesis began to accumulate in our atmosphere. Over a period of about a billion years or more, photosynthetic prokaryotes, bacteria, generated the oxygen gas that now makes up over 20% of our atmosphere, and upon which our lives depend. These single-celled organisms use the sun's energy to transform carbon dioxide in the atmosphere into organic carbon compounds and oxygen gas. Here we see a few modern examples of photosynthetic bacteria, called cyanobacteria. Although each individual cell is its own individual life form, these bacteria often live together in colonies made up of many, many single-celled organisms. A very long time ago, our evidence suggests, Bacteria like these made it possible for certain eukaryotic cells to photosynthesize as well. The products of photosynthesis, carbohydrates and oxygen gas, provided the means for aerobic bacteria to thrive on our planet more than 2 billion years ago. Aerobic respiration requires oxygen, but is capable of generating a huge amount of energy compared to anaerobic respiration, which does not require any oxygen. Cellular respiration became commonplace among living organisms on our planet once oxygen began to accumulate in the atmosphere, and it has been the standard for life ever since, not just in bacteria, but in all eukaryotic cells that make up the plants, animals, and fungi that populate our biosphere. But bacteria were the first to do it, and in fact, they may be the reason that any of us can conduct cellular respiration at all. The word symbiosis describes the long-lasting relationships that form between organisms of different species, and symbiotic relationships are really, really important on our planet. Sometimes these relationships are lopsided, as is the case with parasites and their hosts, who may actually be harmed by the relationship. But sometimes these relationships are mutually beneficial, as is the case of the symbiotic relationship between bees and the flowers that they pollinate, or between clownfish and the anemones that provide them with protection. There is a theory that certain components of our cells originated from a very ancient symbiotic relationship that was mutually beneficial to both of the cells involved. Endosymbiotic theory suggests that the cellular organelles capable of conducting photosynthesis and respiration originated as free-living, independent organisms. Today, we call these organelles the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. And they continue to live inside of our cells, not as independent organisms any longer, but as fully integrated components of our own cellular makeup. 
These endosymbionts live inside of our cells, dividing and reproducing along with our cells and performing functions vital to sustaining life. In the early days of life, way before the first multicellular organisms inhabited Earth, some of these aerobic bacteria were enveloped by larger eukaryotic cells. But instead of being broken down, these bacteria continued to live and function inside of the larger cells. A mutually beneficial form of symbiosis arose, in which a single-celled organism actually lived inside of another larger single-celled organism, providing that larger cell with energy in return for protection. Over millions of years of evolution, this aerobic bacterium became what we now think of as the mitochondria, and all cells originating from those original symbiotic cells contain mitochondria like these. Sometime later, a similar thing happened with photosynthetic cyanobacteria. These symbiotic cyanobacteria, enveloped by larger cells that already contained symbiotic mitochondria, evolved into the chloroplasts that we know today. And the plants and algae that originated from this symbiosis all contain chloroplasts like these. It might sound a little far-fetched at first, a prokaryotic cell living and functioning inside of a eukaryotic cell, but living organisms do crazy stuff like this all the time. Lichens and corals, after all, are both examples of symbiotic relationships between two different organisms living together as one, and nitrogen-fixing bacteria live among the roots of legumes in a similar fashion as well. But despite the modern similarities, as good scientists, we should always ask ourselves, what is the evidence that supports this theory? The first and possibly most compelling piece of evidence that supports this theory is that mitochondria and chloroplasts actually contain their own DNA. This DNA is distinct from the rest of the DNA contained in the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell. More than that, this DNA is organized into circular chromosomes, just like the DNA found in bacterial cells living today. The fact that mitochondria and chloroplasts contain their own distinct DNA supports the theory that these were once free living organisms, because all living organisms contain their own DNA. And if mitochondria and chloroplasts were once independent creatures, it would make sense for them to have their own genetic material inside. Another piece of evidence that supports this theory has to do with how mitochondria and chloroplasts divide and replicate themselves during cell division. Bacteria use a process called binary fission in order to divide and replicate themselves, as depicted here in this figure, and in this false color electron micrograph. When a eukaryotic cell prepares to divide, the mitochondria and chloroplasts inside divide and replicate themselves in a process very much like binary fission. It's very much like watching a bacterium divide from one into two, right down to how the DNA inside is replicated. And this process is quite a bit different than how the eukaryotic cells themselves divide and replicate themselves. Since mitochondria and chloroplasts divide by the same process used by bacteria during division, this supports the theory that they originated from bacteria and inherited this pattern of division from their distant, free-living ancestors. Another piece of evidence that supports this theory is the fact that both of these organelles are surrounded by a double membrane two lipid bilayers separated by a narrow intermembrane space. Functionally, this intermembrane is quite important to both organelles as they exist today because it provides a great deal of surface area or working space in which photosynthesis and respiration can occur. But the original bacteria from which chloroplasts and mitochondria have evolved also had this kind of double membrane, and many bacteria living today, called gram-negative bacteria, also have a double membrane that is very similar. So it makes sense that both mitochondria and chloroplasts inherited their double membranes from their distant ancestors, who also had double membranes. The presence of double membranes in mitochondria and chloroplasts is distinct from other organelles inside the cell as well, and distinguishes these organelles as unique from the others. Chloroplasts and mitochondria really are quite remarkable, and their origins are no less remarkable. Here we can see some of the intricate details of each structure. These black and white images were captured with a transmission electron microscope, far more powerful than the compound light microscopes we have access to at school. In these images, we can see the folded inner membranes where photosynthesis and cellular respiration occur. Life on Earth depends largely on this pair of chemical reactions and on the pair of cellular organelles in which these reactions occur. Though they may have been free-living, independent organisms at one point in the very, very distant past, our mitochondria are very much a part of us today, as they are for all eukaryotic organisms. We couldn't live without them, and they couldn't live without us.
To better understand the process of photosynthesis and cellular respiration, it's good for us to know something about the organelles in which these chemical reactions take place. And the story of chloroplasts and mitochondria is a pretty interesting one, one that started over two billion years ago as a mutually beneficial relationship between a couple of cells. And with that, I will bring our video to a close. Remember, you can go back and watch this video as many times as you need until you feel like you understand what endosymbiotic theory is all about.